is June 24, 2008. My name is Don Linke. This is another in the series of interviews that we're conducting for the Brendan T. Byrne Archive of the Rutgers Program on the Governor. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be discussing uh, the workings of the Joseph Weintraub uh, Court uh, in New Jersey uh, with Sanford Jaffe and Robert Del Tufo, who both clerked uh, for Chief Justice Weintraub. Uh, beginning in 1958, and uh, General Del Tufo continued uh, for a second year as clerk for Chief Justice Weintraub. We'll be discussing their relationship with Chief Justice Weintraub, who had a very significant role in New Jersey legal and policy history. Bob, uh, we'll be talking about your individual relationship with Chief Justice Weintraub more in your, in, in your uh, separate interview and we've already discussed that uh, with Sandy a little bit. But I did want to rehash a little bit, uh, both with him Can and... Can Yeah. So I might be moved back to what a little bit more. Oh, okay. He said, don't block me out, will you, Linky? Okay. Mm -hmm. I've told him my orders are no bald spot shots. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Okay, We're go I'll just start over again. Uh, in each uh, of the separate interviews that we're conducting for this project, we'll be talking a little more specifically about your relationship with Chief Justice Weintraub as clerks and in some cases after your clerkships. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time today uh, having you interact in terms of the workings of the court under Chief Justice Weintraub and some of the uh, major cases and anecdotes that you re remember and stimulate a little bit of exchange uh, between the two of you. Uh, Bob, how did you come to be hired as a clerk to Chief Justice Wanter? Well, I, while I was still in <coughs> law school, I, I, think, uh, I think it was my brother who knew Chief Justice Weintraub and mentioned that, that I was going to be, become available or something like that. Uh, and I went down to uh, interview with him in Newark. He was a justice of the Supreme Court at that time. And I was fortunate enough for, to have him uh, hire me. Of and course, your brother was served actually, as U.S. attorney. Yes, actually, this is a uh, Herb Glickman was his clerk at that right. time. So this must have been uh, in '57 sometime or '58. '58. '58. Yeah, 58. Early '58. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, my brother was the United States attorney uh, under the Eisenhower administration. What do you remember of the interview? You know, I can really picture sitting in, in and I don't know where the office was, uh, but it certainly wasn't in the Mutual Benefit Building, but um, I, I don't know. You know, when you go into something like that, you're really certainly apprehensive and a little bit nervous. Uh, I don't think that he was particularly uh, grilling in his questions, but uh, and I don't think it was too long an interview. I think he just wanted to get a sense of you, and and uh, I think it's I think it was kind of a uh, chemistry type of thing mm -hmm. more than he had he had the uh, the resume and the academic stuff mm -hmm. but it was uh, it was very pleasant and Sandy I think you've said sort of you had a similar impression of the interview I, yeah I uh, I think I I don't know if I've mentioned in my individual interview but I a friend of mine Joe Han Joel Handler uh, had recommended to Weintraub when Weintraub became Chief Justice and he had the authority then to hire a second clerk. And uh, I got a phone call from the secretary and went down for an interview. And it was really, <clears throat> it was already the beginning of the summer. Uh, I remember that specifically because I remember the suit that I wore. Uh, it was a pinstripe suit. Anyway, one of those quotes. I don't have any comment about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Particularly since I had borrowed from a friend of mine who was a much taller than me, which I noticed my job like that. Uh, and it, it was really funny. Uh, and so when I got there, it was in 524 Street in, in his chambers when sitting there. And uh, <clears throat> I would agree with Bob. I got the sense that what he was really mostly interested in is what kind of person you were. Uh, he didn't, we didn't talk anything that I remember about academics, really. 
he wanted to know uh, where I went to high school and where I where I had grown up and how I liked living in Newark and those kinds of things and talked to himself about the fact that he had brought up in Newark and I got the sense that what he was really trying to do is establish uh, your personality, what kind of person you were, mm -hmm. and if you were, if if, the, if, the, if it resonated with him, then that's what he was interested in, in, in looking at, uh, and uh, it was a very very pleasant conversation, and much different than uh, some of my friends who had gone to be interviewed by uh, other justices or judges in the federal. Or or, or state courts have got this long grilling on what they knew about the law. <laughs> Luckily, I did not get that long uh, grilling about what I knew about the law. And like Bob, uh, he said, fine, you know, you've got, you've got the job. And I was more surprised than anything. Of course, you both were graduates of Ivy League law schools located outside New Jersey. Uh, right. Do you think the Ivy connection had any uh, influence with it? I, you know, I... I, you know, it's hard for me to say. Uh, I think, I, I think maybe he probably assumed Bob went to Yale, and as you know, and I went to Harvard. I think he just assumed if you went to Yale and Harvard and you graduated, you were a pretty knowledgeable guy. You had a certain amount of competency, and he wasn't going to worry about that. And whether that was a definitive judgment on his part, I don't know. He had gone to Cornell, and he in fact mentioned that I remember uh, in in the interview. But uh, we spent almost no time really talking about uh, Harvard and I guess Bob, I don't uh, Yeah, well, Cornell was a good, very good place well, for him to go. But, he, uh, you know, he, he remembered his earlier, his upbringings. Yeah. And he, he was not uh, in an affluent position or <clears throat> in a position perhaps to independently go to some of these schools. Right. I, my recollection is that he worked for Ed McGlynn, a right. very very uh, fine lawyer in those times. And Ed McGlynn, he was there as a sweeping up, as, a, as an office boy. And Ed McGlynn took a, a real liking to him and helped him through college and through law school. And then after that, he went back and practiced in that firm. So I think he felt, uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't think he was impressed with the Critical. titles or whether, mm -hmm. where you came from. But I agree with Sandy. He probably thought that if you were a graduate of one of those schools that that you could find the bathroom anyway mm -hmm. and he just wanted to see if uh, he wanted to work with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had the sense that he he kind of <coughs> said, look, uh, these, this is a young kid and he came from Newark and he's obviously not a wealthy kid and has these advantages. I'd like to help this kid out the same way I got helped out. Yeah, I, I grew up in Newark too. Yeah, I was at the, the same right. kind of economic right. circumstances. Right. Yeah, so I had that sense. Uh, that that was that was the kind of person he was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob, did you have an understanding of the role of the clerk? You had family that had legal backgrounds. Uh, do you understand what you were being hired to do? Um, not till I arrived. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Sam? Uh, I agree with Bob. Uh, I had no idea. I didn't uh, even know after I arrived. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you, I was clerking uh, for about 32 <laughs> minutes uh, in a law firm in Newark uh, between my army service. Uh, it was Riker Emory and Danzig, and one of the lawyers there was Charlie Danzig, who was well known in, in legal in legal cir circles. And my job was basically, you know, carry his briefcase. That in those days you had a clerkship. Uh, and, and so you didn't really do anything really serious. And when I went to tell him, Charlie, I got this job with the Chief Justice, Mr. Danzig, I got this. And he looked at me, just shook his head. And I said, what are you shaking your head about? He said, the thought that you will now be deciding New Jersey Supreme Court <laughs> opinions. <laughs> about six months later, I ran into him at a bar meeting. I said, you don't have to worry. <laughs> I said, you may see an occasional footnote that I may have played a role in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I agree with Bob. I, I had no idea either. Well, I guess you're suggesting that your role was somewhat <laughs> limited in this as a as a clerk. Uh, but Bob, talk more about what the role, in fact, uh, became as uh, you understood more what the Chief Justice expected. Well, the uh, the Supreme Court happily had. Uh, a finite number of cases every year. I mean, the appellate division, as now, was more swamped with cases because that's a, the first step, the appeal as of right, and the court had more control over over its docket. And in, in his interview, Dan O'Hearn uh, described the uh, limited docket as a racket. 
<laughs> and a blessing too. <laughs> well, I think I'll just pass. <laughs> I believe when I first arrived that that each clerk for each justice would write a memorandum about all of the cases that were were coming up. I mean, it was a formidable task because uh, well, you know, they heard seven or eight cases uh, every, two, every weeks. two weeks, and in that period of time, you try to put together. A, a very adequate and, and good memorandum about the issues in the case. Um, but shortly after that, we went into a different system, which was to assign to a different clerks, a, 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 assign a particular case to somebody or two cases and, and have it to uh, have the, the law secretaries, I think we were called, right. we were clerks, mm -hmm. uh, submit memoranda to the court, uh, to the court as a whole. Um, and that is essentially what what we were doing was was to get the briefs, uh, which were awful, by the way, predominantly. I just I, even in, at that young uh, age, I mean, they were just terribly written. Uh, and I, I think the court privately commented about that from time to time. It was it wasn't uh, they weren't very good. And we would do research and write the memoranda and. And send them around. Uh, I really don't recall uh, being invited to go to a conference or to an argument. I think I was ensconced at 520 Broad Street right. writing uh, memoranda. And uh, to go back to something Sandy just said, I one hears uh, from time to time about uh, clerkships and about judges who have their clerks write a first draft or or write the whole thing or or participate very, very uh, heavily in the preparation of opinions. That was not Judge Weintraub. If I if I was able to get five or six words into opinion. into a, an opinion in two years, that would be fortuitous. I mean, he worked extraordinarily hard. Remember that work table yeah, that he had right. in his office, and he would just <laughs> and he wouldn't. Uh, he, he just did it all himself. Hmm. Talk a little bit more about his work habits. I just want to make one comment about the brief with, at this point. I agree with Bob, but I remember walking into the chief and saying, it was a criminal case, and the guy had written about 22 points uh, as to why it should be reversed. And then finally the 23rd or 24th point was that none of these are sufficient on their own uh, to reverse the case, the totality of all of these would reverse it. So I walked into the chief and said, what do you do with that argument? How do you handle that argument in the memo? He looked at me and he said, you just throw the brief away generally. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was a really comment. I'm sorry. But, uh, yeah, I, interrupted. But I just wanted to explore more his work style and habits. Uh, when would he come into the office, into chambers? Um, would he do his own sort of book research? And I mean, he's looking at your memos and things, but how, how did he craft his opinions? Well, uh, I remember he would always come in about, I think, around a little after nine. Uh, usually we were there before that. And I, you could tell he was coming because he would carry two suitcase, two tache cases uh, that he took home with him every night, and he would walk straight through the library uh, with his head straight ahead, this, a quick hello, and go right in and, and start work. I mean, he was, it was that kind of serious. And, and as Bob said, you know, he he would work all day long. Um, generally, go to lunch with the. Uh, we were in a suite with Justice Francis, Justice Jacobs, and Scatino, and then the four of them would generally go to the cafeteria in that building and, and have lunch. Uh, and I, I also found uh, that while uh, I can't say I wrote any opinion, clearly not, but that Weintraub was really willing to discuss his opinions oh, yeah. uh, with the clerks. And when he did a draft of an opinion, you know, you could look at it and you could go in and, and tell him why you didn't like this or that. And as Bob said, occasionally you would change an end to a but uh, on rare occasions. Well, I think he but paid more attention to the, to the discussion. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking right. about actually right. writing an opinion. Right. I, you right. just, I he didn't go, yeah. you couldn't edit the thing, right. but you could go in and discuss. And right. he was always, uh, he was always 
cordial and and uh, a friendly person, but he would he would take the time to discuss the mm -hmm. issues with you, and you, you know, you had the uh, option to to be critical, and uh, but but that was that was yeah. the best of the experience because you're dealing with an, yeah. an extraordinarily brilliant uh, person. Mm -hmm. I was used to. So I'm sorry. Sam, no, go ahead. I always used to. Uh, Talk to him, and finally, you know, after about an hour, I was worn down, and, and I, I, I'm saying to myself, "What in the hell is he talking about?" And I walk outside and figure it out <laughs> that he was right. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, but he, Weintraub also had a, a very distinctive writing style. He was known for, and you look at his opinions; they really are crafted beautifully because they're short, they're basically short declaratory sentences. Uh, he was not James Joyce. Uh, there were no run-on paragraphs, and everything was very tightly, tightly organized. And his mind was a very logical uh, mind. And to add to what Bob said about discussion, I don't know. Remember whether I told the story about the famous lease case I did with Weintraub? Well, anyway, I'll quickly repeat it because it, it illustrates the point. It was a case <clears throat> that the court had involving a lease that had been entered into during the Depression. And one of the, the part of the lease that I remembered had provided that the taxes were going to be paid by the lessor, the fellow who owned the, the lease. And uh, well, and the, the person, that the leasee, the person who was living there, could have an option to buy this at any time. Well, after the Depression, the taxes began to go up really significantly. So the lessor was paying this huge amount of taxes, which were even more than the cost of the, of the lease. And the fellow who was, li who was, who owned, who was living, I mean, rented the store, <clears throat> never wanted to exercise the option because it was in his interest to have the guy keeping paying the taxes. So he brought an action to rescind that part of the lease. And uh, having just come out of law school and uh, being uh, fairly inflexible in my legal education, I just looked at the terms of the lease and looked at the law and said, the guy signed that he's, he's bound by it. And I remember writing a memo that way. And Weintraub called me in and said, <clears throat> do I really think this is a fair result? And I said, no, not really fair, but what can you do? That's the way uh, they run a lease. He said, you know, we ought to think about whether we ought to be trying to make a fair result. He said, you know, in the old English common law, there was the doctrine of thou shalt not waste another man's property. And with that, he got up on a ladder. And remember the old English books, yeah. way up in the old English reports, got up on this ladder. He was not a tall man, reached down and got down a couple of the English, old English equity reports with all the dust on it opened the book, flipped through, found an old case written by some chancellor in 1625 or something in which they expanded on the law of waste, that you can't waste. And he said, why, I'm gonna, why can't we apply this doctrine since we are now sitting as a court of equity in law that they've gotten rid of that distinction? Why can't we apply that uh, to this and say that it is unfair and the law of waste takes precedent? I said, you know, you're really, that's great. You're absolutely right. And I thought about that when I went back out, and every time I wrote a memo, I said to myself, you know, is this really a good result? Is this a fair, is this a just result? And I think that was part of the extraordinary <coughs> impact that, that he had on me and the aspect of him as a teacher, when your point about his willingness to discuss. Yeah, you know, um, you remember that case? No. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing them, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the that reminds me that 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 the spending time with him and with the court was the lesson that the most important right. part of any argument to the court was the, was the statement of facts. And uh, if if you put the statement of facts together, kind of like a story, and right. and you know you can't be an advocate in the facts, but you can by the way you put sure. things in. That's what. Because you can get precedents all over the place. I mean, the court sense of, had a sense right. of fairness and justice, and it was important to get the facts that way. Um, the I remember one one incident where uh, Chief Justice wrote a dissenting or a concurring opinion in a murder case, and for some reason he launched into this personal philosophy about life and death and mm -hmm. and the the, the 
uh, circumstances of having being in this life and how, how remote everything was and the whole business and it was really it was really out of place I and I gathered up my courage and I went and told him that and which he said thank you very much you know but then I went to see Justice Francis and I said Justice Francis you know we've got to do something about this really? and Justice Francis went to see him and eventually it came out too bad um, Bob if you don't mind Shame you're not clerking for Justice Scalia. <laughs> His last <laughs> opinion in the, in the uh, constitutional question. Yeah. You know, I'm referring to yeah. his comments there. You could have had an opportunity to take those references <laughs> and philosophy out. <laughs> I, I remember him reacting to Matt v. Ohio and the and the search oh, and yeah. seizure cases. He didn't he didn't like them because he said he said these cases are going to they turn police officers into liars. Yeah. Know? You know, I, I saw them drop the packet of right. uh, narcotics and the like, right. which is which is a point of view. Yeah. And I remember one. Uh, I'm just looking at cases where we could have some kind of impact. Jim Dorman, who clerked for Justice Francis, and I uh, went on a, a a real tear in writing a, a treatise on the two guys from Harrison v. Furman decision, which had to do with Sunday closing. Oh yeah. In New Jersey, uh -huh. <coughs> Sunday closing was there was a Sunday closing law. Everything closed on Sunday and it, it, the justification was it wasn't religious, it was a day of rest. Then the legislature passed this law that that uh, allowed uh, automobile dealerships to stay open on Sunday. That's all it did. It, it was it focused on that. And Dorman and I wrote this. We, we you know spent days on it and and we came, we came up with a theory that that was that the, what the legislature did impliedly uh -huh. repealed the Sunday closing right. law. So we tucked that in as an argument. And I remember going in and uh, the memo was like this thick and talking to him about the memo and <clears throat> and bringing up that point. And he said, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so they all, they all went down to, uh, for, uh, to argument and they, and they came back and the, and the next day the, ch the chief walked in and uh, he called me and he said, uh, well, we've decided that the legislature impliedly <laughs> repealed it. Right. We we came up with that theory during the argument. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. was funny. Uh, he was also known, and correct me if I'm wrong, for writing fairly involved, lengthy opinions with very few citations right. of precedents. Was that somewhat frustrating for you as clerks who were looking up these precedents and? Uh, I presume put th putting them yeah. in your memos to have them mostly ignored. You know, when I, I remember one conversation with him about that. He had no, uh, at least my recollection is that he had no patience uh, with the uh, blue book manual that uh, uh, you would, you know, you would use in law school and writing or on law review or other things. And you know, this is a but CF side or this is a CF or this is an EG or something like that. I remember once writing something with a but CF. Yeah, what is that? He said meaningless <laughs> kind of thing. He just didn't have patience for that kind of of uh, traditional uh, legal research, uh, long footnotes with all kinds of. Uh, case uh, studies that uh, that were not there. He was more interested, as Bob said, the statement of facts, but then writing a narrative about why uh, the court would be doing what it would be doing. And so I think the cases were important to him, obviously as a as a justice, but not a, not in which they be. You know, you have 50 st string cites for uh, there is a presumption of innocence, and then you cite 50 cases. Yeah. <laughs> and he would read the memoranda, and and he right. would. He would know that he's on the right. he's on the firm right. ground, and then I, you know he wouldn't wouldn't go in for uh, as Sandy said string citations or right. the like. One one uh, one thing that I'm sure Sandy will remember, and I and I say this with great uh, uh, fondness and sympathy. Uh, he had a, a secretary called Lucille. Oh yes, very right. And Lucille, uh, God rest her soul, I imagine that by this oh. time. Uh, was she she was really in love with him and she she decided that the only way that she could express this was to be extraordinarily protective and do right. things for right. him and it was hard getting past Lucille right. into uh, into the office that's number one <laughs> and she used to when he was working hard or doing something she used to go in there and and do something that she thought was nice like sharpen his pencils <laughs> or give him right. water or, <laughs> right. or and 
and it used to drive him nuts <laughs> because it interrupted his, his flow. But he was, you know, he was a nice man, yeah, and, so he, and would he would write. just he would just keep it inside. But you could see him. Uh, right. But it, that was. Uh, yeah. I, I, I should tell that quick story. I don't know whether I told the story because it, it's an insight into uh, one truck too about the uh, the McCarthy hearings. Uh, anyway, uh, Bob, Bob would recall, we had a case, court had, court had a case in which Senator McCarthy uh, had come to Fort Monmouth and he had brought a series of witnesses before Fort Monmouth and in the process one of the people uh, he called then brought an action in the New Jersey Supreme Court against McCarthy on the grounds that McCarthy had defamed him or libeled him uh, and so forth. And the defense was that the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution, which uh, prevents a senator from being sued for what he says in the official course of his duties, did that apply uh, in New Jersey, or did it only apply uh, in the, uh, <clears throat> what do you call it again, in the United States Senate, yeah. on the floor of the Senate. So we ca the court came, and I got really interested in that case. And in fact, I once had a, uh, gotten a long discussion uh, with Justice Jacobs on it in our library because he, I think he, he eventually got, uh, he may have written the opinion, no, Weintraub wrote the opinion, but Justice Jacobs was involved in that too. So this was a continuing discussion for a long time. So finally the court decides that, uh, contrary to my memo, that uh, the Privileges and Immunity Clause did apply because he was on a federal reservation or whatever, I forget the reasoning. So I was really kind of really upset about that. I had gotten so emotional about it. So I went in to talk to Weintraub and I actually got in an argument with him and telling him that the court's really wrong and that this is New York's terrible policy and McCarthy's a terrible guy and went through all that. And he finally looked at me and he, he I could see it was one time he'd ever, ever gotten a little annoyed. And he said, would you be happy if I put in a footnote that said the law clerk disagrees with that? <laughs> and being the dummy I was, and I, he, I said, yes, I would be happy. He said, don't come in here for three days. <laughs> <laughs> I walked out and never forget that. <laughs> I thought to myself, uh, it's okay to be a young clerk at that point. There were some strong personalities on, on that court, but she certainly yeah. was the leader, and everybody right. got along well. I mean, there was Justice Jacobs, right. a real scholar, Justice Francis, Justice Hall. Uh, oh, yes, was very, very confident. Terrific, uh, terrific uh, guy. But you know, from the afterwards, by, as you said, Bob, I, I don't remember even. I don't remember if we ever did go to an argument uh, while we were clerking. I, I don't think we argument. did. But when finally, uh, afterwards, when I argued a couple of cases before the Supreme Court, I, I would see a couple, I was always amazed. He would completely, Weintraub would start a court by saying, now look, there are two or three issues here that really I think are important, and why don't we move to those? Uh, and you know, you didn't, if you had a set speech, you moved to those. That and that's a good way to handle yes. the argument because otherwise you just go all mm -hmm. over and people keep pulling you in different directions. I, you probably heard this story at the, uh, uh, when I was sitting in that panel with uh, Debbie Poritz and other and other uh, other people. But I, I had a, an argument uh, before the Supreme Court. I think it was a criminal case. I think uh -huh. I was in the prosecutor's uh, office then, and, and uh, or maybe it was, I don't know. In any event, <clears throat> I'm arguing the case and and Justice Hall. <laughs> who is a very nice right. man, but he starts on me, and you know, he's very smart, right. and he starts asking these questions, right. and, and I'm responding, and I'm responding, and I'm responding, and I'm sinking further <laughs> and further <laughs> down. And, and, he, and he asks the last question, which was the Lollapalooza, you know, no. that was going to be the end of me. And <clears throat> Weintraub interrupted him uh, as he was finishing the question and said, uh, I think what Justice Hall means is and then he he played out the whole, the thing. whole thing and he looked at me and he said do you agree with that <laughs> Mr. Del Tufo and <laughs> I didn't understand what they were talking about <laughs> and I, I the only thing I said to myself <laughs> is, yes. is he trying to hurt me or, or is he <laughs> trying to help me and I decided the latter I said yes <laughs> and then I was driving home I figured it all out oh, it was, it was absolutely a perfect summary of everything I had tell one other great wine shop thing uh, I don't know if I mentioned this either but uh, Bob would, will enjoy this uh, how I got sworn into the into the bar uh, I was in the Army. Uh, did I tell the story? Yes, but go ahead. I really, okay. I was in the Army uh, when I uh, found out that I had passed the bar, and I was out in 
some field that we were doing a, a week of rifle range or something like that. I got called up by the lieutenant who had gotten a uh, telegram from a friend of mine that I had passed the bar. So the captain was really a nice guy and he said, look, do uh, you have a swearing in ceremony? And I said, yeah, in Trenton the next day. He said, why don't you go? He said, well, well I'll get a truck for you. I'll drive you down to the uh, terminal. I was in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and I'll drive you down. We'll drive you down and you can get a late train. So I got on, I got on a late train from, um, <coughs> uh, from Jackson, from uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, up, up to Trenton. Unfortunately, as Amtrak and even those days wasn't Amtrak, it was Pennsylvania Railroad, <laughs> was late. So I didn't get into Trenton uh, until uh, around 11 o'clock or 11.30. And I think the ceremony had been at 10. So there I am and with my army uniform and my duffel bag, all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, the ceremony is over and I'm in the Trenton station. So I figured out, well, well, I'll at least call the clerk of the court. I don't know why I thought that, but I think I'll do that. So I called, and the clerk of the court answered was John Gilday. And he uh, gets on the phone, and I, I explain my situation and all that. So he said, wait a second. And uh, he said, I'll go. Uh, I'll talk to the chief. And then he said to me, uh, come over to the Supreme Court. Uh, the chief's going to swear you in. So I get, I took a taxi, I went over to the court, walk in, I'm standing there all by myself. Out comes Weintraub and the full court. <laughs> all of them in their robes. And he then swears me in. And then comes down and shakes my hand. And I'll never forget that. Oh, well that's something not to forget. That's amazing. Yeah, that was an amazing, boy, what an insight into, into, into that, into that, uh, per, into that person. Bob, you <clears throat> referred to before to a bit of his judicial philosophy in terms of criminal law. Uh, let's discuss a bit more uh, how you saw his uh, views on criminal law, consumer law, and the other areas that were uh, before the court at the time and how he shaped uh, legal policy from the bench. Go ahead, Sam. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think my recollection is that uh, Weintraub is what we would probably call today, uh, or even in those days, uh, reasonably conservative on, on criminal law. Uh, <clears throat> he, he, he felt that uh, <clears throat> he thought there were boundaries. He would not be considered uh, uh, as a, uh, he would be considered as fair uh, in, in, in that sense. But. Uh, I think he wrote a, a really uh, an, an interesting opinion on, I remember, on the defense of mental incapacity uh, when, when he was, when we were, Bob and I, clerked. And uh, New Jersey did not take a very liberal view uh, on that. There was a big issue at that time. I forget the Durham rule or the non-Durham mm -hmm. rule and what the implications of that were. But I remember him fairly strongly reading that court to a fairly conservative view of the role of mental incapacity in, uh, in criminal law. And I don't think he was uh, a great fan of, uh, as Bob said, of uh, the search and seizure provisions. I mean, he would actually apply them. And at, at times, he was kind of annoyed, uh, particularly at times when the Third Circuit on a writ of habeas corpus would take a view that would be contrary to the New Jersey Supreme Court view on a criminal law matter. And he. He, I remember uh, he was very concerned about the federal-state relations and that no, no kind of thing. On the other hand, in the civil area, I think he was really way in the forefront. There were cases that the court handled uh, on negligence and on product liability. I think, can't remember the Pennington. case. Pennington. Right. One major case on product Justice, liability. Justice Francis wrote, wrote it. Right. But that was really a groundbreaking case on Before product liability. Uh, right. So in, in the civil area, uh, and also, also I remember in, in the procedural area, he was not a great fan of, uh, of uh, the pre procedure in the sense that procedure would hurt you. He could think of ways in which uh, procedure would, uh, w would not interfere with, with his concept of justice, the court's concept of justice. I agree with that on, yeah. the, on the civil side. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember specific cases. If I went back and looked, uh, I'm sure I'd come up with with some that uh, would be of interest. Yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> on the criminal side, uh, very conservative, yeah. uh, but reasonable. And the Matt v. Ohio right. business that I mentioned before, he just thought that 
that law enforcement should should not have its hands tied right. as long as they acted reasonably, right. and that that Map v. Ohio, as I say, would turn police officers into uh, do, do you remember we not were, telling the truth. Bob, we were once kidding and then said, I think his mother's house had been broken into at one point, and I think I remember kidding with you and saying that's probably as long as it's all your criminal law. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would never tell him, obviously, <laughs> but I remember you and I kind of kidding uh, about that. You know, Don, I'm going to have to leave in a couple of minutes. Let me, let me just say one thing about this is off the point, but you, you're talking about calling John Gilday. Yeah. Um, one thing that's extraordinary about the New Jersey Supreme Court, the clerks are very accessible right. and they're very friendly, right. and you can ask them questions right. and they they ask or they refer you somewhere. I, you know, if you call right. some places, like in some other right. subordinate courts, you really get a hard time. You get right. passed around. John Gilday was was someone you with right. whom you could speak. Steve Townsend has been there oh, forever, yeah. and he's he's never yeah, changed I, over I also the years. Think, I also think Weintraub, from my recollection, <clears throat> uh, took quite seriously, but not overemphasized his role as the uh, head of the administrative uh, yeah. function of the courts. We'll discuss uh, that a little bit yeah. more. But, uh, uh, but, you know, I really don't know a lot about it, except that it did take some of his time. I would be sitting there, and I remember he'd get phone calls about that, or we'd talk to John Gilday or, or others, oh, excuse me, about it. But I think he saw, I think he saw administration as a vehicle, uh, not, a, not, as a, uh, not as really as an end in, in, in itself. And he wanted it to move quickly. He wanted to move efficiently. He didn't want to penalize people uh, for it. And, and in those days, you know, the administration wasn't that big a deal. I mean, we we're talking about a court system uh, and a justice system uh, that was, you know, relatively small compared to what it would eventually come fairly quickly. Now, one thing that would bother him, though, is, is when a judge, a trial judge or someone, something like that, did something that wrong or did something stupid. I mean, and he, he was an activist. Uh, yeah. He would... He would get uh, right into it and, and try to correct the yeah. situation. And, and in course, in some areas, he stretched judicial authority fairly far, right. like attorney discipline and uh, contingent right. fee uh, well, restrictions. Yeah. I, that may yeah. have been a little he bit did. later. I but remember that. He also uh, got rid of the clerkship for, for young lawyers. I remember that. That was a really... I mean, he didn't have patience for those those kinds of things. Don, I'm really going to... Do, okay. do you mind? Two minutes? Sure. Okay. okay. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit more, and you've mentioned somewhat his relationship with the other justices, but uh, you, you talked about the oral argument and how he would shift... I guess the focus of the oral argument. Behind the scenes, what was his relationship with the other justices in terms of writing opinions, the revisions, and so forth? I never detected any friction or uh, upset on anyone's part. I think, I mean, he was he was a very strong leader, and he certainly was. That was his court, and he was in charge of it. But I think he dealt with people very effectively, and I didn't see any any sign that yeah. anyone was ever upset that. They would go to their conferences and vote, and he just signed things, and everyone seemed to be uh, in close harmony. I got the sense that the, the other three justices, Jacobs, Coutinho, and Francis, uh, they were all, they, they seemed to get along ex exceptionally well. Yeah, there was Hayden Proctor. Proctor. I mean, there were, I never sensed any, any uh, uh, sense of antagonism or any sense of anything but close friendships. As I said, I, I think they went out to eat lunch together each day. I think they talked together a lot. Um, so I think I, got, I would agree with Bob. I think it was a, it was a friendly court. It was a court that uh, there were no antagonisms on, although there were disagreements, but that's okay. Yeah. I'll go back and look at through the, flip through the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court reporter, uh, if you like, and look yeah. to see if some cases ring a sure. bell and happy to then say I've got some cases that ring a bell I'll yeah. call you back okay thank you okay mm -hmm. thanks very much good, well, to, see good, you. good to see <laughs> you Bob <laughs>